Also, our uh, speakers today are Dr. Mike Van Cleft from the New Jersey Invasive Species Strike Team, talk about terrestrial invasive species and management techniques. And then uh, from the New Jersey Water Supply Authority, we have Nick Zemlichenko. Nick does a lot of work overseeing our uh, preserve properties and other properties um, for the Water Supply Authority and is going to talk about some common backyard tree ID for things around your neighborhood as well as the spotter and lanternfly and emerald ash borer. So we have a lot of great information today. If you happen to cut out, if you have any problems, if you have to leave, this is being recorded. It will be on our webs. Um, a link to it will be on our website, New Jersey NJ and then under the resources page, uh, we'll send a link out after this is done, and the recording should be up by Thursday night. Um, just a quick note on the River Friendly Program. So this is a partnership between the New Jersey Water Supply Authority, Raritan Headwaters, and the Watershed Institute. Um, as you can see, that map over there shows our main service area, but we have started working with people outside the area as well. It's mostly the watershed for the Raritan River, which provides a lot of drinking water to the people in central Jersey and is an excellent ecological resource as well. Um, and the very important Stony Brook millstone watershed that's part of it. As part of the River Friendly Program, we do a business certification program, a golf course certification program, as well as schools and residents. Um, you can take our resident River Friendly quiz online and receive one of those signs for your yard if you pass. I don't think we're handing, sending them out right now um, because people aren't really in their offices, but you'll get it eventually. And we're always around to help answer your questions and to try to put you into great resources like today's webinar. So here's our webpage. Again, under the resources tab is where this will be listed as well as anything we hand out today. Um, I just wanted to plug next, uh, not next week, but two weeks from now on May 6th, we're gonna have an organic lawn care and lawn alternatives day with speakers from uh, Save a Tree to talk about organic yarding, as well as um, a speaker from Jersey Friendly Yards to talk about beautifying your property, using native plants, how to use their database online to find great native plants for your yard. It's one of the things that I love and recommend all the time. You can choose things based on deer, resistance based on shade, based on your soil type and what area you live in. Um, it really gives you great recommendations and they're gonna show certain methods for turning lawn into garden as well. Um, on Wednesday, May 20th, we're gonna talk about harmful algal blooms, aquatic invasive species, and how other people can help. A lot of things that you do, things you apply to your lawn, and in, when you're in the water, uh, how you take care of your boat affects the spread of invasive species and um, proliferation of harmful algal blooms. Um, real quick, if, you can, if you're having audio trouble, if you click these three dots on the bottom, a thing will pop up for audio connection. If you're having audio problems, you might not be able to hear me, but then you can click audio connection and you can call in, or you can have it call you um, by typing your phone number. Um, and I am going to Done with my introduction, and I'm going to send it to our first speaker, who's Mike Van Cleft. Mike, you there? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. I'm going to make you presenter now. I just see a symbol for your phone, though, so I hope it goes to the correct thing. Did that work? Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Um, are you able to share your screen? Did you get the, get the thing? There we go. Oh, good. I see it. It's coming up. Oh, 
Okay, great. That looks good, Mike, if you want to get going. And then um, for everyone else, under the participant sign on the right, or if you hover the bottom, there's a little chat bubble. Um, you can use the chat to ask questions. And then once Mike's over, I'll try to feed him um, any questions that come in. Okay, all right. Things seem to be working. Um, all right. Well, I've never done this before, giving a talk where I can't see anyone I'm talking to. Um, so hopefully this will go smoothly. Um, Kyle, does the, the, does the chat show up along the way? Or like, will I be able to see things that people type in real time or is that just towards the end you wanna do this? Perhaps, I just typed in like, hello, if that shows up on your side. Um, yep, I saw it. Okay. Okay, so um, so as often I do, I'll be talking about it in CC today. Um, and the strike team is a, a statewide uh, project under the Friends of Hopewell Valley Open Space. That's what the acronym stands for, uh, F-O-H-V-O-S. Um, so yeah, all right, so let's get into it. So basically the strike team's um, goal is to protect natural lands through coordinated strategic invasive species management. So, and we're the only group that's solely dedicated uh, to that focus. Um, you know, so much about invasive species are very overwhelming uh, when you start to see them all. So we really do focus on having a coordinated uh, response uh, to them. And the ways we do that include uh, mapping, data analysis, and reporting. So we have a phone app that anyone could download and provide data to us and make us look smarter by you telling us what you know. Um, we do outreach, you know, things like today. Um, we also do training workshops for the public and, and also for professionals, um, you know, professionals that aren't necessarily um, as, as cued into invasives as us, they have other expertise. Um, and then the sort of nuts and bolts of our, of our work is searching and eradicating. You know, we, we don't want to just sort of talk about invasive species and rank them and this and that. We want to find them and kill them before they spread pretty straightforward. Um, so we do the searching early, you know, referred to as early detection rapid response. We, we still have a focus on newly emerging invasive species. Um, you know, trying to keep them from becoming widespread, but we also work on any invasive species at all, especially um, in higher uh, priority uh, habitats and such. Uh, so this is us. This is the, the strike team staff. Um, it looks like a lot of people. It is a lot of people with lots of good expertise, but we're all very, very part-time as a general rule. Um, so it isn't like we have this whole crew of full-time people working on it. We're mostly reliant on grants and contracts and then what other contributions we can get um, to work off of topics that aren't directly in a grant or directly in a contract. We have a, a four member steering committee uh, just to keep us up to, up, up to speed on what's going on and get their feedback on how we operate and we meet annually and we have an annual report we go over. And then we also have a very important group of people, our technical advisory committee, um, which bring, as you just look at the list of people, to a lot of expertise they bring to the table. And that's what helps us with listing species or knowing what the next thing to worry about is. We have all these uh, folks that are out there um, doing their job and telling us things that are relevant to the strike team. So we're very thankful to have this group. You know, so the context, a little bit of context. Um, I think a lot of folks have seen this graphic, um, <clears throat> how much development has occurred in New Jersey since, you know, just about 50 years ago. And where it stands now is we do have just over half of the state is still in natural cover. Um, and, you know, we're, we're grateful for that remainder, but the other 50% or so has a large impact on what's left. Um, refugia for deer, sources of invasive species. So, you know, as we sort of tighten 
tighten the news, so to speak, around our remaining natural areas, uh, what we do in the non-natural areas has a big impact. So yeah, just a short list of some of the things we've done. Um, you know, obviously habitat destruction of abundant deer and bases, uh, agricultural soil modifications have a huge impact. Uh, areas that were farm field that are now forest tend to be the most impacted by invasives. We've altered fire regimes, stream flows, habitat fragmentation, and you know, just for kicks, global climate change. So there's a lot of things that impact what's happening in our remaining natural areas in New Jersey. So obviously very basic stuff. So an invasive just by definition has introduced from an area outside of its range, grows densely and excludes others, and has, you know, obviously cascading impacts on, on the natural areas just by growing densely and excluding other species. Now, so some of the numbers um, estimated that there's about 10,000 non-native plants were introduced uh, in New Jersey. We do know that there's about 1,000 non-native plants in our flora. So these are plants that have escaped from cultivation and now reproduce on their own. And out of that 1,000, only 35 are widespread invasive plants. So you get the idea, you have a lot of plants introduced and a much smaller number that are widespread. And um, 100 emerging or potentially invasive species. And this is, you know, it keeps ticking up a little bit every year. Another couple or two get added to our list and I'm working on that this morning. Um, so, you know, 35 is very bad. And those are ones that we tend to know about, Japanese barberry or silkgrass or garlic mustard, uh, et cetera. But the problem can get much, much worse uh, if we allow these emerging and potentially invasive species to join that 35 widespread. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot, as always, to worry about. Um, and, you know, the strike team is, is doing what it can to try to keep species from becoming widespread. Okay, so emerging species are, they're new to a specific area and they have the demonstrated um, potential to become widespread. So, you know, we follow, this is from our technical committee and, you know, I'm always have my ear to the ground for what's going on in New York or Pennsylvania or south of us. Um, we know things that are invasive elsewhere have a high probability of being invasive here. Um, so that's how we, we determine our list. So I'm just about to update for 2020. I need another couple of days, but this is where we were um, in 2019. 145 species are on our target list. Um, so that's emerging invasive species, or we refer to affectionately as targets. Um, so that's a little over 100 plants and 44 animals, and animals could be a pathogen or an actual animal, a bird or, or a mammal or something like that. So 145 is the total. Um, <clears throat> so part of the way we think about how to prioritize is each of those species is provided a stage. So we have stage zero would be something, for example, that has less than 10 known populations in the state. So we have 62 out of our 145 species fit into that category. Stage one is like 10 to 100, you know, so we have about 40 of those. You get the gist, stage two is even more. Stage three is essentially uh, knocking on the door of becoming a widespread species. And strategically, how we think about them is we say, you know, if you're gonna go after any invasive species to do control work, stage zero and stage one are your highest priorities. Um, stage two and stage three, sort of a, un unwritten assumption that those are likely to become widespread species as time goes on. Um, but the stage zeros and ones, we have a much better chance of, of uh, keeping from becoming widespread. All right, so in addition to those 145 species, there's 78 widespread species that includes plants and animals. And then we have a watch, a watch species list that uh, we're not sure where to put them. We don't want to not think about them, but we're not sure whether we want to call them targets or not. So we have a category for watch. 
So some of the stage zero examples um, <clears throat> on the left is uh, sickleweed, on the right is Japanese spirea. So these are things, the sickleweed story is interesting. Um, and it's sort of, to me, what, what the value of the strike team is all about. Someone said, I found this crazy plant uh, at White Lake in Warren County, and no one had ever heard of it anywhere else in New Jersey. And I just looked it up and it's like, oh, it's a major rangeland pest, um, you know, further west. So it's growing densely, just like the picture. It looks just like that out at uh, White Lake. And the past was, oh, I don't know, um, an eighth of an acre, you know, maybe a little less. And that was our opportunity. So unfortunately for this bugger, I live pretty close to White Lake and I got my gear together and I went out there and I sprayed it um, and pretty much killed 99% of it. Every year I go back and nip off a couple other ones that escaped my attention. But you know, that's what early detection rapid response is about, um, not letting that continue to grow and then get spread to other sites. Uh, Japanese spirea appears to be popping up more and more frequently. There's probably a handful of locations known. Uh, the strike team has been involved with treating a couple of those. But, you know, these are the examples of things just starting up. And now we hope that lots of people become aware of. So more eyes, the better. You know, sort of in line with that early detection rapid response is, is, is really just trying to prioritize, realize that it's a, a triage situation and, you know, you do your best. Um, but we like to focus on those stage zero and stage one species for sure. And as far as susceptibility goes, you know, what, what sites are better or more deserving of protection than other sites? Um, it seems that two of the biggest factors for whether a site is infested or not is whether it had past agricultural use um, and what the current deer abundance is. So in the upper left, it's the worst case scenario. So the land had been tilled in the past, might be forest now, but it was tilled in the past and the deer abundance is high. That's where you're gonna get most of your invasives and the least amount of native plant cover. Uh, the lower right is the best case scenario where you have low deer abundance and no history of agricultural tilling. There is a natural resistance. Um, and that is primarily due to the, uh, the agricultural impacts uh, on the soil. Once agriculture has happened on soil, it is pretty much, um, it's just so dramatically altered from a natural forest soil and it just tends to support weedy plant growth. So when you're looking to prioritize where to do your work, you probably want to do it. Well, there's not many places with low deer, um, but there are areas that have not had past agricultural land use. And those are going to be areas that you have the best chance of keeping healthy or returning to health. So as far as what to do, if you're a land manager or a land steward, um, Priority number one is reducing the deer herd. Uh, we have outrageous numbers of deer. Um, we missed it this year because of uh, uh, COVID, but we do annual deer surveys in Hopewell Township and regularly get over 100 deer per square mile. And the literature suggests that 10 deer per square mile is what you need for health, forest health. So we have an outrageously high amount of deer and that really does leave areas susceptible to invasion. Um, and then when you get, if you, if you do a good deer management program, and I'd be happy to talk about any, to anyone about, you know, some of the uh, tips and tricks for running a deer management program. Uh, but once you've, you've accomplished that, and that should be your priority number one, is invasive control work. Again, starting with, um, uh, starting with uh, stage zero and stage one species, and then moving to um, areas that have more conservation value. And that, and that doesn't necessarily mean, um, you know, the best forest in New Jersey is the only place we should work. I sort of mean that to be whatever piece of land you're 
um, dedicated to protecting, within that, pick areas that have the best value and work on those areas first, such as areas that are older forest habitat that were never plowed. And then, obviously, restoration is great when you can do it, but it tends to require money or more money than the first two. Um, but restoration is obviously required in most situations. <clears throat> I don't seem to be advancing now. Um, first reason. And I'm not sure where that orange mark came from either. <laughs> yeah. Oh, maybe you, you might, if you go to the, all the way to the left, there's, yeah, I think you might have clicked like some kind of edit mode by accident. You see that? You see where there's like a squiggle thing? Maybe try to unclick that. Uh, squiggle thing. Yeah, at the top of that green bar, gray bar. Oh, this one? Either that or if um, you go down to that bar where it looks like the pop-out thing is, maybe that'll change it. Yeah. Yeah. To figure it out, um, I can, I can like restart you. Um, yeah, I might need that. I can't see what to do for my... Okay. Okay. Let me try to give it back to you. <clears throat> okay. I think you have it again. Uh, oh. Yeah, I got it. Okay. Very good, thank you. Um, okay, yeah, so, you know, there's plenty of examples of early detection rapid response. Um, one of the, on the left, there's a photo of uh, Chinese silver grass standing, uh, just asking for it, at a fault lake in Hopewell Township, which in that meadow that it's in is very diverse, a naturally diverse, great meadow. We found one plant and we killed it, end of story. Um, if we had done nothing or waited or, um, you know, the, the bottom picture is from North Carolina, uh, is Chinese silvergrass completely infesting a meadow. And once you have that situation, yeah, sure, you could get rid of it and spend the money and restore it, and you'll probably get something that's still a shadow of what that natural meadow is above. So that's what early detection rapid response is about. You have to know which things when there's only one or two of them that you actually should be quite worried about and put in the time, relatively minimal time, to just get rid of the threat before it gets worse. So the strike team's been around since 2008, and here's some of our numbers. So we're, we're very proud of how much work we've been getting done. And this is like the strike team and partners, uh, but a lot of work has been done. Um, and we keep plugging away. Um, just very brief detour, just to give you an idea of other things that we're up to. So we have a very large grant with the United States Forest Service. We're working with uh, 50 private landowners and then public landowners, developing, you know, concise um, stewardship plans and basic species management plans um, that uh, kind of take all those things that I just mentioned into account, how to prioritize. So we're, that's a very big project for us that we'll be doing a lot on this year and then wrapping up next year. We do a lot of contract work with Essex County Parks, Morris County Parks, Morristown National Historic Park, and Princeton. So we, we, these are, you know, very specific. We work with these partners, figure out what we want to, you know, what they want to get rid of it's their land, um, and we help them do that. And then we've been doing a lot more, uh, we did a lot more outreach in 2019 than 2020. Um, and we hope to do as much as possible under the current circumstances uh, this year. 
So we do tabling events, we do training sessions, um, and educational presentations. One of the things I'm excited about is uh, local strike teams. And again, if anyone has an interest in this, please reach out. Um, basically, there's people, people in particular places that really care about a particular piece of land. Um, and, and there's definitely groups like that around. And some of them have organized into what we call local strike teams, but they can be extremely effective um, and make lots of progress. The uh, Friends of Great Swamp, there's a Great Swamp strike team, and they've just done off the charts work, uh, the Great Swamp, which is a place that's extremely uh, deserving of attention. It's an incredibly special place. Um, so they've done regular regular work days through the entire year, including winter, on uh, invasive species control. Uh, Watch on Reservation, I think last year started up there, Strike Force. Um, Hilltop Reservation has um, uh, one person in particular that's outrageously effective at getting things done. Um, and there's other groups that are out there too, uh, Foots Pond, Jackson Woods, and, you know, depending, we could come out, we could, we always talk on the phone or email or whatever. I try to help folks. Um, and then sometimes I'll do site visits and have a very rapid assessment of uh, prioritization of control work moving forward. But we really try to encourage this because there's obviously no way in heck that the strike team uh, in and of itself is going to have as much impact as we'd like. There has to be a lot more people working on the problem. And I just got to, even if, no, if no, no other reason to remind myself, there is a point to all this. Um, you know, New Jersey has an incredible amount of, of natural beauty. Um, you know, the, there's actually, the, the, if you look in the middle, the yellow flowers off to the left, that's Hammond's Yellow Spring Beauty, which is actually uh, endemic to New Jersey. Um, but there's just outrageous things uh, all over the state, very good things. 2,000 native plants, um, lots of things worth protecting. Also lots of different animals as well. Uh, dragonflies, <clears throat> Sussex County has the greatest number of dragonfly species of any county in the US. So it's things like that. We have federally listed bog turtles as our strongholds for them. Uh, globally rare Northern Meadowlark butterflies towards the lower right. Um, and yeah, even on the bottom there, well, we have humongous bears, that's for sure. That was in still water. Um, but we also have enough wildness to have timber rattlesnakes, for example, and that's the lower uh, right. You know, so it definitely just kind of reminds you that there is plenty worth saving here in New Jersey. And what we really need um, to prevent invasive species from spreading more than any of anything else is deer population low enough that forests could look like this picture. So there should be something from the ground level all the way up through the canopy, shrubs, uh, tree seedlings, saplings, subcanopy trees, canopy trees. Without these things in place, the land is susceptible to invasion. So, you know, Deer overpopulation, it can't be underestimated um, how big of an impact they're having and how tied, how strongly tied they are to the invasive species problem. So um, I'll go into control methods and I won't hit every species that I have listed, um, but um, I'm, I'm in, I intend for this to be a resource for people to look back on and uh, if they want to. Okay, so the first, first aspect of control is not making the problem worse. Um, so we have a do not plant list and we have a landscape planting pledge. And if anyone wants to sign that, they could reach out and we could provide that to them. So what we ask people is to say, any new plantings moving forward, um, any new plants you buy for your yard, make them species that are not on this list. Um, and every year we update it, like I said, like, I'm working on the 2020 list. That'll be out pretty soon. Um, it's a two-page thing. The first side is commonly available for purchase. They're arranged by growth form. 
And, um, you know, you, when you're look, ordering online or at a garden center or whatever, you know, you can check the label, see if it's anything on this list. Uh, the flip side of that is the not commonly available. So these are things that essentially no one really buys, but we were completing this, we listed them um, as species to not plant. So, so sort of like early detection rapid response, not purposely buying and spreading plants is a great control method. Don't don't even start, so to speak. Um, once plants are out there and you want to control them in natural areas, there's, you know, a set of different types of categories of, of control. So biological control, mechanical, chemical, cultural, ecological. Uh, ecological is primarily uh, deer management. So there's examples in Hopewell, there's, um, there's a number of examples, but uh, Baltate Mountain is a very good example of native spice bush out competing um, roses and barberry in particular. No control of, no direct control of the invasives. Just take the deer, uh, reduce the deer, and let the native species grow and out compete invasive. It does happen and there are places that can be pointed to. So, you know, ecological control is, is ultimate, the ultimate success of reducing invasives will rely on ecological control. Um, chemical control is the, you know, sort of typical land steward method where you're using herbicides. Mechanical control is, tends to be wishful thinking. There's not many things that you can um, control just by cutting them. They tend to grow back. Um, some minor examples or mechanical control working would be, a, you know, a labor intensive effort to get rid of garlic mustard in a particular area. That could absolutely work. Uh, biological control is really the only way on a big scale to get rid of a widespread invasive. It's a very time consuming process, like more than 10 years type of process um, where folks will go to the country of origin of the plant and bring back its natural enemy. Uh, something that only eats that, that's very specific to the invasive. Okay, so on our website, we have um, guides, um, and this is uh, from our experience and, and more particularly Art Gover from Penn State's experiences. Uh, he is definitely the weed killing guru. Um, so we have this set of recommendations where we say what percentage of different uh, herbicides for particular uh, control methods. So um, FS1, is our general mix, and it has a certain percentage of glyphosate, a certain percentage of triclopyr. And even more helpful than the percentages is the next slide where we say how many ounces of the concentrate uh, out of the bottle do you need to put into a gallon of water. Uh, so we get very specific about the recommendation. Quite frankly, we got tired of doing the math over and over and over again. Um, so we have uh, put this down and it's on our website. <clears throat> so, um, I'm trying to keep up with the notes, but they blink on and off. <laughs> Sorry. I, I think someone said, is there an alternative to glyphosate? Um, the triclopyr, the next one over, can be used uh, to kill most plants uh, if you have an aversion to glyphosate. Um, okay, so, you know, do we, we, we do things by the book. Um, we don't just sort of like just fill up a backpack with herbicide and go out merrily spraying things. Uh, we're all uh, certified applicators. Um, when we have seasonal help, we have, they become certified operators. So there's a training involved, a, cl a class and 40 hour training for the operators before they're allowed to do anything on their own. Um, mostly volunteers that aren't certified can use herbicides if a certified applicator is physically present with them, but that's something that uh, isn't, doesn't happen very often, if at all. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, there's the training and such, and obviously there's just good housekeeping things uh, that are on this slide as well. Um, 
So yes, these are the three main herbicides that use for invasive species control. Um, you know, there's different techniques. FS is foliar spray. CS is cut stump. Uh, BB is basal bark. It just gives you an idea on the table of what percentages you're using when you're doing different techniques. And obviously, you know, safety is, is critical for individuals applying, um, which is probably the, 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 as far as safety goes, the bigger concern is, is immediate, um, if the person applying, it. um, these chemicals are not. They're not DDT. They don't stick around in the environment for years and years and bioaccumulate. Uh, we're more mostly worried about the safety of the individual applying. So you wear nitrile gloves, long sleeves, goggles, things like that. Um, and you apply widely. Um, so the guy in the middle is shooting herbicide way over his head. That is a very serious no, no, you do not do that. Um, when we apply, well, I'll do it in the next slide. But obviously, there's a, a lot of things to think about for safety reasons. So when you do a foliar spraying, um, we never apply to plants that are greater than four foot tall, just because then you're aiming up, and when you aim up, uh, it could drift or the wind can take it. So um, we're spraying things that are generally low to the ground. And it is an effective way to control things. Um, in many cases, foliar spraying is the only practical way to control things. If, if there's many stems or very dense growth, as long as it's less than four foot, foliar spraying is, is a good option. Um, more labor intensive, but much more directed uh, when it's feasible is cut stump technique. So in this case, you cut cut the plant close to the ground a couple of few inches off the ground and you apply herbicide only to the spot that you cut. So that is a great way to, to direct where you're putting your herbicide. Um, <clears throat> and that's usually the glyphosate diluted in half with water. Um, you could also use the triclip here um, as a cut stump application. What, what the folks at Great Swamp found out um, and I've been, been using more and more is winter applications of glyphosate cut stump can be extremely effective, even things when um, you normally wouldn't want to cut because they're strong re-sprouters. Well, if you cut them in the winter and put do a cut stump treatment, they can die over winter slowly and never re-sprout. So it, it opens up a window of treatment through the entire year. I mean, basically, the only limitation is how cold you feel, um, you know, but you, I believe, like, you could use glyphosate even in the low 30s, um, and it, it's a very effective way. And I, I personally like it, too, because there's cut stuff treatments are already very directed, but when you do it in winter, nothing's moving around. You know, there's no other, other, other uh, insects and things like that moving around, which is great for not getting bitten by ticks. But, you know, it's also good for reducing any potential exposure to anything other than your target. So I, I'm, I'm definitely recommending winter treatments more and more. Um, basal bark is also a great technique um, for summertime treatment, generally. Uh, the label says you could do it in winter, but it doesn't seem to be as effective as doing it in the summer. So that's again a part of the learning. The worst thing to do is apply herbicide and not be effective. Um, if you're going to use it, you want to make sure that you're being effective. So really strongly resprouting things or tough to kill things like autumn olive, uh, basal bar treatment in summer is fantastically effective. And if you ever seen how big autumn olives get, you probably be disinclined to do cut stump treatment on them too often. And foliar spraying is out of the question because they're too tall. Uh, so basal bar is a great technique for, for things like automobile. Another method, you know, somewhere in the middle with labor requirements is uh, uh, hacking square technique. I honestly almost never do this, um, but it could be a good thing for big plants. I think this picture shows an Atlantis tree um, getting hacking square treatment. And occasionally it, it makes sense. Um, 
but not terribly often in my opinion. Another thing that, another technique which is more directed uh, that works really well to have in other species is um, it's called the easy jet. And it's not cheap. We got grants to purchase two of them in the past. But basically it's a long cylinder, like five, six feet long. And you load herbicide bullets, uh, in quotes, uh, into it and you push, push it into the plant and the, the little bullet injects a little herbicide. You can see the bullet doesn't shoot into the tree. It's sort of like a spring loaded thing. But the herbicide gets right into the tree and it's a great targeted um, method where there's no exposure to herbicide to the user or the environment in any way because it pushes it right into the tree. Um, so we, <clears throat> we wanted to look into this because we had multiple rare species on one of our sites and we didn't want to broadcast herbicide during the growing season. So we bought this easy jack and we were able to kill thousands and thousands of stems of, of tree of heaven. Um, and what we found out is if we sprayed like a big one, like in this picture, um, all of the little clones shooting off of it that are, you know, little skinny little trees coming off of it, they all died along with the, the parent tree. So it was extremely effective uh, treatment, something to think about. Uh, Easy Jack, it's called. Uh, so here's some, I'll go through some more of these species. I don't want to take up too much time. I think my time's getting closer to running out. So I'll, I'll go through a couple of examples, but again, this is, um, this is um, uh, available to anyone who wants this. They could look at it, uh, the, the presentation that is. Calorie pear is a very hard to kill one. Also very responds or uh, well to being easy ejected or basal bark treatment. If you did strong re-sprouting, like I said before, one of the tricks that the folks at Great Swamp found it was cut it in winter and apply glyphosate to the cut stump in winter. But don't try that in the summer. Do easy jacked or basal bark in the summer. <clears throat> Japanese Aurelia, another similar strongly resprouting species. Japanese maple, believe it or not, I hate to believe it because it's such a beautiful tree, um, is definitely becoming invasive. Seedlings are popping up in the woods well away from where they were planted. Norway maple, like I said, I think I'm going to skip through a number of these, um, but the resources available to you. Tree of Heaven we spoke about. Uh, there's a whole series of shrubs that I'm extremely concerned about because they represent something that doesn't really exist in New Jersey, class of invasives that are shade tolerant, very tall, clonal. Um, so these are species, so in my ideal world, <clears throat> there's not too many deer and things like native spice bush over top shorter invasives like barberry. Um, even in a world where there aren't too many deer, uh, those spice bush are going to have to compete much more strongly against these tall, shade tolerant, um, non native invasive trees, uh, shrubs. So, buckthorn is definitely one to keep on your radar. Uh, glossy buckthorn is becoming a horrible pest in wetland areas. Um, we all know and hate Japanese barberry. Um, it's actually one of the easier plants to kill. It's not a tough one to kill. It's just that there's millions of them. So there's only so many that you can kill. Uh, jet bead, I definitely want folks to be thinking about jet bead. It, it had a, a very long lag phase, uh, but it appears to be accelerating now and showing up in greater numbers in more locations uh, in the last five years or so. Linden viburnum. Uh, this is one when the strike team first started out, I was convinced it was an emerging invasive species because I didn't know of many of them. Uh, once we got uh, the public providing data to us and our conservation partners and everyone, we had thousands of records of Linden viburnum in our database and had to grudgingly call it a widespread species. Uh, but it is a, it's a terrible invader. Again, tall, shade tolerant, very highly threatening to our forests. Multiflora rose, 
um, is one of the original invasives out there. Oriental photinia, extremely threatening, clonal, large, shade tolerant uh, plant uh, taking over large parts of, in particular, in Princeton areas, very hard hit by photinia. Seabold viburnum is not quite as widespread as photinia, but it is uh, very highly threatening, uh, a lot of it in Morris County in particular. Um, also a very tough to kill species. Uh, this is something that uh, you don't want to cut in the summertime because it'll re-sprout very strongly, but you could uh, easy eject it, you could basil bark in the summer, uh, or try cut stump with glyphosate in winter. Wing burning bush, also you can tell why people want to plant it, uh, but this is also highly invasive. One of the, there's always exceptions to the rule. This is one that does get some amount of significant deer browse. And when that deer browse is removed, it becomes actually worse. Uh, so like I said, there's always exceptions to the rules. English ivy clearly responding to, uh, or at least in my opinion, clearly responding to climate change. Um, moving from south to north, it had been known to be invasive 20, 30 years ago in warmer places, and it has been moving from south to north, large infestations, multiple infestations in South Jersey, and, and it pops up everywhere in the woods. You can find English ivy seedlings popping up pretty much anywhere randomly in the woods now. Um, honeysuckle, I think this will be the last one that I talk about in any detail, but I did some work at Watchung Reservation last year and I read a report from a botanist in 1953, I believe it was, or 52, somewhere around there. And he was assessing the Watchung Reservation and mentioned um, a single invasive species that he was worried about, and that was Japanese honeysuckle. So I've read other reports from around um, you know, old, old studies, botanical studies, and this, this is absolutely the first invader that was serious in New Jersey, and it's still going strongly. Um, but it gives you some perspective of how quickly things have changed. Um, now, 1950 might seem like a long time to you, but in nature's view, that's a blink of an eye, barely, half a blink. So what we've done is we've dramatically altered our flora um, across the state and beyond. In, in, a, in a very short period of time, you know, so why are invasives bad? I mean, there's fruit on that. Uh, the middle picture is fruit. Isn't that great? Birds could eat the fruit and they do and they carry it and they spread it. But when you have any single species taking over a large amount of ground to the exclusion of others, you know, think about it this way. Even if that fruit were the most perfect food item that you could ever imagine, it only makes that one kind of fruit at one time of year. So if it was the an analogy would be like, um, you know, you can go to the grocery store and you could stock up for two weeks in October for all your food for the year. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> you know, if it were a combination of native plants, like I would say it always, always was beyond earlier than 1950, um, you had different fruits of different qualities, different types, making fruit at different times of year, spread out across the year. You know, there was food resources available uh, for lots of things throughout the year. So, you know, there's plenty of examples like that. Autumn olive taking over a field that makes a fruit that does have some value to wildlife, but it's one kind of fruit made at one time of the year. It replaces 15 different native shrubs of diff would have different fruits that have different qualities and ripen at different times of the year. So that, that's really the crux of why invasive species are bad. Um, and the perspective on it is that pretty much everything has changed in the last 50 to 70 years. Um, and that is very likely part of the reason why we've lost so many of our, uh, so many birds, uh, bird populations are uh, dropped by a third over the last 50 years. Is that a coincidence? Um, which obviously just more than one factor, but completely altering their uh, habitat is likely one of them. Uh, so yeah, so honeysuckle, 
And in that same paper for Washington Reservation, he said, um, there's a couple of tree I have in, no big deal. And they just planted a hedgerow of multiple rows, which I thought was terribly amusing. Um, so they, you know, back then they just had no idea which things might become invasive and they had very little experience with invasion, invasives in general. So it's not surprising they wouldn't know. Uh, but yeah, everything has changed dramatically in the last 50 to 70 years. Um, yeah, so I think I'm going to wrap that up and I'll just kind of go through the slides real quick here, but um, there's lots of stories behind all of these and you can download this and you can always ask me questions. Please consider using our phone app. Again, I'm not, I think I'm a, I want to move it along, but we do have a phone app that actually will be getting an update and I'll be reporting on that soon. So we have our phone app. And we also, anyone that collects data, our database is available on our website for download in multiple formats. Um, and, you know, I think there's a durability to having a publicly accessible database that anyone can access. And you can suit it to your own needs. And that's all I have. Okay, great. Thanks, Mike. Um, again, he, he went through a little fast there at the end, but do consider um, downloading the phone app so you can help report things as you see them. Um, do you, do you want to talk about that a little bit more, Mike? We got like a couple minutes and then we'll um, switch over to Nick. Yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, yeah, a phone app. Um, I can go back and see a couple of things real quick. It's going to look a little different than this soon. There, there's the uh, EdMaps people at the University of Georgia are having a, uh, a webinar right now about the new national app they're having that will, I've been, I've been told, will still uh, have a very specific New Jersey list for us. Um, but it's going to look something like this. Basically, you could, um, you know, look for things by species categories, you know, aquatic plants, birds, grasses, insects, et cetera. It has everything. Um, the example, you could look at it by scientific name or common name. If you saw something floating in the water, uh, you would say, ha, that's an aquatic plant. I will select aquatic plant. And then when you do on the right, all of the aquatic plants on our list pop up with little thumbnails. Um, it's not iNaturalist, it doesn't have the AI and all that, but you could click through the pictures, uh, hit the I button, and say you thought it was water chestnut. Um, it would provide a series of pictures, it would provide a written description, and you can kind of try to identify it from there. And then it would also show you where around you populations have been found. You can click on any one of those records and find the details. Um, reporting is much easier than now than it was a few years ago before we kind of updated it back then. Right now, you have to take a picture of it. Your phone gives you us the GPS coordinates and you tell us roughly how many there are. So, you know, it's not something where you gotta count everything. It's about two to 10. 10 to 100, 100 to 1,000, greater than 1,000. So it's pretty easy to use. <clears throat> and then the records come to us and we verify them. So if you made a mistake and put the wrong species down, no big deal. Um, we could we could fix that. Um, so, you know, I don't want people, I, I, I my experience in the past is, you know, not everyone's a botanist or very few people are botanists actually. Um, and they're concerned about having a wrong ID when they submit something. And, and my response is, don't worry about it. Uh, we can figure out what it is from the, from the picture if it's not what you thought originally. And what I've been telling people recently is download iNaturalist, try to get the ID from that, um, and then use our app to report it. Okay, great. Yeah. Um we had gotten a decent amount of questions coming in about specific plants. Um, I think the best way to do that is to look at Mike's website. We will have a follow-up email with a lot of the information that he had here, um, where the, there were notes that you can refer to for specific things. 
and uh, I guess a lot of the um, forms that he showed, he said, were on the website as well. So we'll follow up with like easy ways to find that easily. Um, there were kind of two two quick questions about your organization, and then we're going to switch switch it to Nick. Um, one was. How can somebody like find a strike team to join? You had mentioned those couple of uh, strike teams. Um, yeah, I, I, that is something I've been meaning to do. There's there's a handful of them. It's not like there's a lot. Um, but if someone reached out to me, you know, send me an email and I'll try to see who's the closest one to you. Um, and there's always the option of starting your own. So that's that's also on the table. But uh, if if someone reached out to me, I can try to connect them to the group that's closest to them. Okay, great. We'll um send your email out so people can reach out with that. Um, we'll also send out. We do encourage you to take that pledge today that for the no plant list. That's a great thing to do on Earth Day, and that will be in the email as well. And then one more question before going to Nick. Um, I saw somebody just had a good one with like, is there anything people can do to get invasive plants out of landscaping stores? Is there anything with, I mean, I've seen some, not really with landscaping stores, but um, some municipalities have had um, ordinances like against planting invasive, against planting new invasive species. Um, do you have any way people can help with things like that? Um, yeah, they do. It tends to, the statewide efforts, um, that I was involved with over a decade ago kind of never came to fruition. It got thrown in the in the heap. Um, there is a statewide plan out there though with numerous strategies. It, more or less it comes down to municipal action at this point. Uh, like you said, there are municipalities that have either passed ordinances or sometimes it's related to new developments, um, re, you know, requiring either native plants or no invasive plants for uh, project reviews for new developments. And otherwise, I think there's maybe a couple like Princeton that have sort of a, an advisory to, uh, they actually use our do not plant list and sort of set, recommend that people don't um, utilize them. You know, otherwise, you know, without uh, government ac activity, uh, we're on our own doing voluntary things or, or um, the next level up would be trying to convince your municipality to implement things. All right. Um, thanks again. So that was um, Mike Van Cleff again, and we are um, switching over to Nick now. If you have any questions, um, you can feel free to try to follow up with Mike. We'll include his email in the things at the end. So, um, Nick, you doing okay? Yeah, are you able to hear me okay? I can hear you fine. I see like your web screen. Okay. Um, how about now? I just switched over to the first slide of the presentation. Nope, I still see your web screen. Okay. So it indicates that I am sharing right now. Try that one more time. How about now? Do we switch over to the presentation? Yep. Okay, I'm going to start from the first screen there. You got that? Got that. Okay. So, hello, everyone. Um, this is Nick Benlochenko, Assistant Watershed Protection Specialist with the New Jersey Water Supply Authority. 
want to thank you all very much for joining again. Um, great to be presenting on Earth Day. Got a number of different um, topics to get through today. Um, so I'm going to try and hit the high notes. And uh, if you have any additional information or stuff I gloss over, the entire presentation will be made available on the New Jersey River Friendly website in the resources section. So with that, we'll jump right into it. Um, I'm going to begin with some common New Jersey backyard tree ID. I'm going to stick with all of, uh, all native species. Luckily, Mike was able to delve into some of the more known um, invasive tree species, of which there are plenty. Um, anybody driving around the last couple of weeks, a couple of weeks ago now, uh, we'll see all the white calorie pear specifically, uh, very prominent this time of the year, and you'll see just how many are actually in the landscape. So we'll focus on some native stuff. So first, we'll get into the, uh, the northern red oak, which uh, is the state tree of New Jersey. Um, it's a great urban tree. It can tolerate a fair amount of pollution, um, stormwater runoff, and uh, compacted soils, which is a big deal if you're going to be organizing a tree planting in, uh, in an urban area. The average height is uh, 60 to 75 feet with around 45 foot spread at maturity. It's a pretty fast growing tree and it also has a, a very good quality of, of wood that is oftentimes utilized for a number of different woodworking uh, activities. Of course, uh, it's got a great wildlife value. Acorns are near the top of the food preference for a number of different uh, New Jersey wildlife species. These are talking deer, uh, white-tailed deer, bears, uh, wild turkeys. Everything is, uh, is basically utilizing that. And uh, it offers great shade because it has a, a dense canopy most of the year and it holds on to its leaves a, a bit longer than many of the other uh, deciduous forest trees we have in the area. Additionally, it has great fall foliage, generally ranging from a bright red to sort of a, a russet um, red in color. Uh, red maple, this is another one that is super prominent uh, this time of year. The last couple of weeks, driving around, you'll see these are the trees that have the, the very red, prominent red buds. Um, they bring color to your landscape year-round. Got great fall color, um, ranging from gold to yellow, brilliant red. Not a particularly um, tall growing tree. They generally average about 40 to 60 feet with around a 40-foot spread at maturity and it's a medium fast growing tree. An interesting fact about this one not many people know about is um, you want to at least keep an eye on if these trees are planted around any horse pastures. Um, the dry wilted leaves can actually be toxic to horses if uh, they are consumed in mass quantity. They have a good wildlife value. Um, the Samaras are utilized by squirrels and a variety of other small rodents um, as well as deer consume um, the more tender shoots and leaves of the tree. So I tried to provide as many um, distinguishing pictures as I could. They have a sort of a three-tiered uh, leaf, very similar to the, the sugar maple that adorns the, uh, the Canadian flag. And um, their bark is generally relatively smooth with uh, some wrinkles in there as well. Uh, the black walnut tree, this is one that, uh, that's pretty prominent to, to identify identify most of the year. Um, it's obviously most well known for its well-ripened uh, nut crop that appears late summer into early fall. Um, and those begin to bear that crop around 12 to 15 years of maturity. They often want to grow to be a rounded shape um, when possible. When, it's, uh, when this tree is growing in the forest, they may not have the opportunity to do that but it will generally reach 50 to 75 feet of maturity. And if possible, it will reach a similar width as well. It's a pioneer species and often found in post-agricultural land. And it ha has a deep tap root, which often makes it difficult to transplant um, a black walnut to a different location. Again, um, it has a high quality wood, uh, often used in woodworking for its handsome grain and durability. I'm sure many people have seen different um, furniture made out of black walnut wood. And another fact about this particular native species is they have innately compound alternate um, leaflets on each one of their leaves. As you can see in the top right here, this is actually one leaf with a number of different leaflets coming off of the, of the single leaf. 
Black cherry um, is another one, pioneer species, often growing in post-agricultural soils. You can see them growing in, in windrows, um, other disturbed areas along the side of old agricultural fields. Also very well, well known for um, its, the beauty of its wood for, for woodworking. Um, it has white dangling lace-like blossoms in the spring. So if you happen to have any black cherries on your property, that could be a, a good way to identify them right now. Uh, good wildlife values, the, the fruit, of course, the, the cherries are consumed by a variety of different species here in New Jersey. Um, oddly, tent caterpillars can be a pest for black cherry. Uh, they seem to prefer the tree over other similar native species to, uh, to live in. You'll see those uh, sort of silky white nests um, right around this time of year, all the way up till June. They can also be allelopathic to other species of plants. So where you have maybe a, a row of black cherry growing and they're dropping all of their twigs and their fruit, um, they, they can actually emit a chemical that can prevent other species from um, germinating in that same area. Next, a very common one here in Central Jersey, uh, tulip poplar, very fast growing. Uh, one of the tallest deciduous trees we have in the east um, it, it can occasionally reach heights of 150 feet at maturity. Relatively narrow crown. Um, it has a very distinct star-shaped foliage that you can see in the, in the top left. Um, the right are the actual yellow-orange tulip-like flowers that the, the tulip tree grows uh, from where it gets its name. And these are very beneficial to a number of different pollinators, including butterflies, uh, songbirds, and hummingbirds also utilize tulip poplars heavily when, when these uh, are available. Cone-shaped um, seed heads remain in the late fall after the leaves have fallen and will generally remain through the next spring when, when bud, uh, bud break is starting to happen. Somewhat weak wooded tree, uh, often during storm events, thunderstorms, large limbs can, can break from this tree as uh, it doesn't have the most sturdy wood and they can attain some pretty tall heights. So uh, that's something to, to keep in mind as well if you have large tulip poplars growing near your residence. Okay, next we'll get into ash trees. We're going to get into a li little bit more detail um, for the ash trees as it'll pertain directly to the first invasive um, insect that we're going to be talking about, the emerald ash borer. But ash trees also have compound leaves. Uh, of course, one, one leaf is in the top left corner. Um, number of different leaflets, five to nine, coming off of that one leaf. They have opposite branching, as you can see in the center two photos, and new growth generally happens at a 45 degree angle from the main stem. Next, when you're looking at the bark, um, the white ash in particular, and the green ash, has a raised diamond pattern bark um, that makes it pretty easily identifiable. So, Common species of ash tree here in New Jersey, there's three of them. The white ash being the most common, um, of course, it has the, the diamond-shaped uh, bark feature that I had mentioned. You often see those taking up a, a large percentage of our forest stands here in central New Jersey. The next one, the green ash, you'll occasionally find them wild, but they were often planned in residential plantings in the 70s and the 80s, they were one of the most uh, go-to species um, that contractors would plant as they were planning uh, their, you know, their, their new development. And unfortunately, that did not age well. Um, lastly, the black ash, all the way on the right, has a much different bark than the white and green ash. And uh, it is actually very regular and even scaly in some effect, the rare tree in the area, very susceptible to emerald ash borer, usually growing uh, along riverbanks or stream corridors where the soil remains inundated for a, a large percentage of the time. Interesting fact about that one is uh, black ash trees were heavily utilized um, by Native Americans for basket weaving due to the wood's uh, ability to be broken into strips. Um, just we'll gloss over this real quick. And what makes the ash tree particularly important is just the amount of ash trees that we have here in New Jersey. They actually represent 9% of our forest with up to 25 million ash trees in New Jersey. Um, 
they all have similar features for the most part, um, but it is just uh, very important that we understand some of the key concepts for the Emerald dashboard as you're dealing with a pest that could, could and has wreaked havoc on a tree that represents 9% of our forest. So, getting into the Emerald dashboard here, of course, it's an invasive flying beetle. The adult is around a half inch long and an eighth of an inch wide. You can see two of them. Um, failed against a penny in the top right corner. The cream colored larvae, which do the lion's share of the damage to ash trees, um, have a 10 segmented abdomen and they cause their damage by burying into the cambium and form under the exterior bark layer of the tree, which essentially starves the tree of nutrients and, and water uptake and um, over time, that will cause the tree to decline and ultimately die. And of course, um, adults feed on the actual leaves of the ash tree. A little bit more on the damage explained. Um, of course, when the uh, nutrients and water uptake method is destroyed, the, the tree is, is going to decline. 99.9% um, .9 staggering percentage of untreated ash trees are condemned once infested with emerald ash borer. Um, also, all ash tree species in North America are at risk for this infestation. It doesn't just focus on one or another subspecies, as well as a related species, a very similar tree, the, the white fringe tree. So I'm going to show you a, a few different telltale signs of emerald ash borer infestation. All the way to the left, we have crown foliage and dieback, which is a very telltale sign that a stand as a whole could be infested with emerald ash borer. You're going to see vertical bark splitting. You can also see some woodpecker damage in the center photo. On the right, we have epicormic sprouting, which is when the tree is in heavy decline. It's trying to push out any growth, any leaf growth it possibly can coming from the main trunk of the tree in an effort to get leaves out there to photosynthesize to make its food. So if you see a tree on your property that looks like the tree to the right, it's, it's far gone. All right, the next, we, next thing we have here is, uh, I often get questions about this all the way to the left, blonding, woodpecker damage. So the woodpeckers, number of different species, are trying to access the larvae that is directly underneath the exterior layer of the tree, a layer of bark of the tree, and oftentimes in a heavily infested area can strip a large percentage of the tree from all the way at the bottom of the trunk to way up into the canopy of its exterior bark. And you'll see this ash tree that literally looks like it's becoming blonde because it is missing that dark colored exterior layer of bark as the woodpeckers strip it off. In the center, You'll have D-shaped exit holes where the larvae ultimately emerge as adults. These can be tough to find. I wouldn't rely so much on, on that one as, as some of the other signs that we're talking about here. And all the way to the right, um, you can actually see, I took this picture along the, the south branch of the Raritan River, and the exterior portion of the bark was, was at, the tree was in heavy decline. It had fallen off. The tree was certainly ready to fall down at any moment. And you can actually see the serpentine marks where the larvae are feeding underneath that exterior layer of bark. And you can imagine that there's enough larvae in a particular tree, that kind of damage easily um, will lead to its decline and its ultimate demise. So where is the emerald ash borer in New Jersey? At this point, it, it could be in, in most places uh, statewide. Every, it seems like every year, more and more municipalities are being added to the list by the New Jersey Department of Agriculture. And strangely enough, they actually need to capture an adult um, emerald ash borer in order to confirm a municipality as having it. Being, spending most of my life in Raritan Township and Hiring County, I, I can tell you that <laughs> there have been stands that have been absolutely devastated by the emerald ash borer over the last 10 years. And if you look uh, at Hunterdon, uh, Raritan Township was only confirmed in 2019, so that's something to keep in mind as you're looking at this map. Certainly more and more will be added each year. So, 
Emerald ash borer was technically first confirmed in May of 2014 in Somerset County. There have been a total of 17 counties with various municipalities in them that have been confirmed as locations for um, presence of emerald ash borer. So, can ash trees be saved? The answer is yes and also no. Certain ash trees can be saved if they're lively and active growing with more than half of the leaves of the canopy intact. Um, also, if they're valuable to the property owner or enhance the landscape in any way or a unique tree that you're looking to preserve. This is a very important part, showing minimal or no outward signs of emerald ash borer infestation. By the time you're seeing um, a, a heavily impacted ash tree, that tree may have been infected with um, emerald ash borer for up to five years at that point. And by the time you're seeing those symptoms, the tree is going to be too far gone to be saved and is not a good candidate for treatment. Treatment pros, of course, it gives high value ash trees a chance to resist and survive infestations from emerald ash borer and ultimately their demise. Treatment cons is it certainly does not guarantee resistance or survival from infestation, especially if it's already infested or in a high um, infestation area. If, you're, if your tree is surrounded by trees that are stripped from top to bottom with woodpecker damage and blonding, even treatment might not um, be able to save the tree. And also, it's expensive and it's often cost prohibitive to treat many trees. So if there's one tree in particular that is important to you on your landscape, um, that might be the tree to look at for, for treatment. Um, and you can make the decision if, if you think it's worth it based on other criteria. Trees that can't be saved, um, unhealthy or more than missing more than half of their crown and foliage, if they're growing in poor sites or otherwise unimportant to the landscape at your property, um, ash trees showing many, one or more really outward signs of emerald ash borer in infection. This is a tree that um, was heavily stripped by um, woodpeckers trying to get at that emerald ash borer larvae. Um, that one obviously would be not a good candidate for treatment. Um, so if really if it's showing any of those signs that we talked about, the tree is uh, already infested and, and not a good candidate for treatment. So we'll get into some of the chemicals that are typically used for emerald ash borer treatment. The first one I'm going to talk about is uh, chemical trunk injection using emamectin benzoate as the active ingredient, and that is uh, injected directly into the trunk of valuable ash trees that you're looking to treat in areas where um, emerald ash borer populations are high in the locality and the insect presence is confirmed. And this generally has a high success rate. The next one is a chemical soil injection or drench where a chemical um, imidacloprid generally is, direct, is directly injected into the root zone under the drip line. And the drip line is as far as the branches of the tree go outward from the actual trunk of the tree and down. This is generally where the root zone of that particular tree is and the chemical is then uptake, um, uptaken that way. This is generally used um, where EAD is expected to be in the locality in the next one to two years as a preventative step. Um, and it's also a poor choice if you're near a water body as oftentimes chemical, the active ingredient can leach um, out of the root zone um, and into a, a local water body. So you want to be careful with that. Finally, systemic basal bark sprays using um, the active ingredient dinoteferan around the base of the trunk is another option for chemical treatment um, where EAB is expected or confirmed, although this one has a somewhat mixed success rate. Generally, I recommend the chemical trunk injection using the emamectin benzoate-based products. Um, there's several chemicals out there, um, trade names such as Arbormectin or Triage 64, which utilize that active ingredient. The chemical is direct, directly injected into the trunk of the tree by a certified arborist professional that is licensed um, and taken up by the tree and distributed throughout. It has a high success rate, um, particularly in areas with high EAD infestation. And this part is particularly important. One application every two years for 10 years. 
and you have to remain um, consistent with that. That's a long time. Uh, you have to make sure you're doing the treatments on a regular interval every two years. Um, otherwise, if you lapse, the tree will be um, susceptible and vulnerable to uh, infestation when the chemical active ingredient ultimately runs out. The timing of the application is mid to late spring after the trees have leafed out for the year. And on the bottom here, you can see an image of sort of how that process works. Advantages and effectiveness. Direct trunk in injections, I think this is a, a, a large advantage, um, eliminate potential spray drift, such as uh, maybe you would get with a bark spray. Uh, therefore, reducing at both applicator exposure and minimizes the impacts of, of non-target organisms from becoming exposed uh, to that chemical. Um, Imamectin benzo was found to be the most effective product and provided two to three years. We recommend two years uh, of nearly complete emerald ash borer control. Adults will feed on the, the trees treated with the Imamectin benzo. And a study had shown uh, within four days, uh, the adults had, had died and the larval densities were reduced by a staggering 99% compared to the untreated trees. Uh, Dinotefran, the bark sprays, and the imidacloprid, which is the soil drenches, only provided a year of control and a, a much lower uh, mortality on adults that fed on the leaves of the trees, as well as larval density um, within those treated trees. And also the time until mortality was much longer with those products as compared to the MMX and Benzo. So what everyone wants to know, what are the treatments cost? So the average price that seems to be for most contractors is about 11 to $15 an inch. So for the purposes of an example, I decided to use a 24 inch diameter at breast height, which is how trees are generally measured. It's about four and a half feet off the ground using a specialized um, tape measure. And you would be looking at about $264 to $360 per treatment every two years of it with a tree of that size for the MMX and Benzo treatment. Um, so you're looking at about $132 to $180 per year annual cost over 10 years, of course, at the zero, 1320 to 1800 um, range for treatment of the tree over 10 years. Comparative cost. What is it going to cost if I just wanted to cut that same tree down? Um, most contractors for a 24-inch ash tree uh, estimated the job at approximately $1,500 to $2,000 for a straight up removal of that tree in a residential area. Um, of course, that is a comparative cost to the 10 year treatment price. And in, in that method, of course, you get to preserve it for the future, which is great if it's a tree that is unique to your property that you enjoy having there, that you hope to have there into the future. Other benefits to consider, uh, preservation of biodiversity for future generations, valuable wildlife habitat, et cetera. I found this part interesting. Using the Urban Tree Alliance Emerald Ash Borer Management Cost Calculator, they are actually able to put a dollar value on what value that tree provides to your property. Some of the things that are taken into consideration include carbon storage, carbon sequestration, a laundry list of different things that I won't read, but I, I just found that interesting that they were able to actually put a dollar value on uh, the, both the annual and 10-year benefits monetarily of that same tree. So the next step, you want to determine uh, if, if treatment or removal for the ash tree on your property. You have to determine the financial responsibility if you can undertake that for a process of 10 years. You're going to find a professional arborist contractor to inspect the tree, offer you a price quote, and eventually administer the treatment on that recurring basis that we talked about. You're going to monitor the tree annually, and this could be both you and the contractor, um, for signs of emerald ash borer damage, satisfactory foliage when the leaves come back in the spring, signs of dieback, anything like that. 
consistency is really the main part on retreating every two years for 10 years. You got to remain consistent on that and uh, plan to remove hazardous trees, particularly in high risk areas, whether that be near your residence or uh, power lines or driveway where you keep maybe your vehicles. Um, make sure that you do not move uh, infested ash tree wood or chips um, far from the local area where they were removed. Let's say it's your property. You don't ever want to transport that wood to outside of the municipality, particular, you know, possibly to a new area that doesn't have a very high rate of emerald ash borer. You don't want to be moving that invasive pest to somewhere where it isn't already. And uh, again, you know, just selective harvest. This is sort of the long-term outlook. Um, the Department of Ag is constantly monitoring for uh, the spread of emerald ash borer in new counties and municipalities. Don't transport ash tree wood or chips. And um, you're going to have the option of treating high value, rare, or otherwise unique ash trees. Otherwise, the plan should be to begin planning their removal. All right, if everyone's still with me, we're going to get into the, the next pest that has dominated much of the uh, media attention over the last few months, uh, even a couple of years now, the spotted lanternfly. Give you a little bit of background on them. They were first detected in September 2014 in Berks County, Pennsylvania. They're native to the Pacific Southeast, China, India, South Korea, Vietnam. They can make use of over 70 different plant species, and that, that list has actually increased, so it could very well be more at this point, um, including fruit and ornamental trees, woody trees, although the number one host species, plant species, not surprisingly is another invasive, the tree of heaven or alianthus. The damage uh, from heavy infestation of spotted lanternfly uh, can be very significant. Uh, for example, grape harvest on impacted vineyards can be reduced by 75 to 90, even 100 percent in some areas, depending on the infestation rate. Here is a snapshot of what the life stages look like. The spotted lanternfly has four different instar nymph stages that you'll see on the left compared to a tape measure a couple inches long. The first second and third instars have a similar look, although they get bigger as they go through the different molting into the different stages, but they are black with white spots. The red nymph, fourth from the left, um, is the last stage before you get to the adult. Um, that one has some, some red on its wing pads as well as its abdomen and head. The adult Phase, all the way to the right, of course, is probably the most identifiable. It has brilliant colors, red, black, white. Uh, when it's at rest, as you can see on the bottom center photo, the insect is sort of a brown, gray color with, with spots on the wing pads. All the way to the left, you have an egg mass that is laid by the adult uh, from September through November, and that can range in color from sort of a pink all the way to a dark brown. And in each one of those egg masses, it contains 30 to 50 eggs. So here's just a better look at the nymph stages. They will be appearing very soon, generally late April through early summer. The adult stage, um, very identifiable. They look different, um, of course, when at rest as opposed to when flying. And they will be appearing late summer, generally July through the fall. Here are some photos of egg masses. Uh, over the winter, early spring, and late in the fall, this is the number one way that uh, spotted lanternflies are able to spread. These eggs can be laid on almost any substrate. Um, as you can see, the color ranges. Um, and they can affix to almost anything, from trees, wooden decks, park benches, even vehicles. Um, so you definitely have to keep a close eye for those. How do I dispose of them? Um, the egg masses can be scraped off of whatever substrate they're on. Uh, you can either literally squish them, or if you want to keep a sample um, double bagged and thrown away after exposure to um, either alcohol or hand sanitizer can revitalize them. 
adult specimens uh, could be treated very much the same way. Um, you could absolutely squish them, <clears throat> or you could go the route of the alcohol and san hand sanitizer to devitalize them, although hand sanitizer is kind of a bit of a valuable commodity right now, isn't it? So this is just another view of how you can go ahead and dispose of egg masses. They can be scraped off of whatever substrate they're on with a stick, an old credit card, whatever you have handy. And um, of course, when you remove each one of those egg masses, you're removing 30 to 50 eggs per mass. Here's just a quick overview of the life cycle again. This one from the Pennsylvania Department of Ag. Um, of course, starting with the egg masses, moving through the four instar nymph stages, coming back up top left, the adults emerging in July and will be around until really it's, it's too cold for them to persist November or December, and they will lay those eggs in September through November. Spotted lanternfly key host plants. Uh, as I mentioned, over 70 species can be utilized. Some of their favorites include tree of heaven, top left, grapes, vineyards, bottom right, apple orchards, and believe it or not, Christmas tree farms uh, can also be a host to the spotted lanternfly. <clears throat> the tree of heaven or ailanthus, not surprising, comes from the same region, um, China, south to Australia. It's the most preferred host tree of the spotted lanternfly. It can grow almost anywhere uh, except for un un directly underneath a, a shaded canopy. They need, uh, they need basically direct sunlight. Um, and they like disturbed soil as well. So you'll find them growing along railways, roadways, fence rows, forest openings. There are several native lookalikes, <clears throat> or at least plants that have similar features. Here's just a couple of pictures of the Tree of Heaven characteristics. Um, the bark looks a lot like uh, cantaloupe, in my opinion, and they also have the, the compound leaflet. The leaves are smooth, they're not serrated, and they also have uh, the samaras, the seed pods in the bottom right, although they can also spread new trunks um, from existing root systems of existing Tree of Heaven. So here's a comparison to a staghorn sumac on the right. They're pretty easily identifiable due to the, the, the red um, buds that come off of the staghorn sumac, but the leaf setup looks very similar. Uh, additionally, uh, black walnut has some, some similar characteristics, but the, the rigid bark of the black walnut and the actual walnuts themselves are generally enough to distinguish the two of them for most people. So they damage plants by using sucking and piercing mouth parts to extract sap. Adults and larvae will feed on the foam of young stems and ex excrete large quantities of this liquid known as honeydew. Um, forming and clustering of thousands of spotted lanternflies on one tree or plant can accelerate the, the creation of this honeydew, which if it accumulates at the bottom of the tree, can facilitate the growth of a sooty mold that you'll see on the next slide. And that can lead to um, a number of different problems for the host plant, uh, infection. Additionally, any feeding creates weeping wounds, which then attract other insects such as wasps, and insects that want to bore into the tree, which could additionally cause problems. So here's what some of the damages look like um, you can see the thousands of spotted lanternfly individuals that can um, wreak havoc on whatever tree that they plan on utilizing in a heavily infested area. And that white sooty mold I mentioned that's growing around the bait um, can cause problems for the tree as well. So what does speak? Um, these numbers from the Pennsylvania Department of Ag show that between forest products, crops, um, property values, tourism, ecotourism, you name it, um, you're talking about a dollar amount in, in the billions of potential uh, loss in revenue, depending on 
which walk of life you're in, which is almost any. Here's a bit about the quarantine expansion. In New Jersey, we originally had three counties, Warren, Hunterdon, and Mercer as our three first counties that were put under quarantine for the spotted lanternfly. Pennsylvania also had a number as well, being the state where they were first located. Um, the yellow coloration indicates new quarantine counties that were added. In the case of New Jersey, Somerset, Burlington, Camden, Gloucester, and Salem were just added last year. Give you a sort of wider view. Um, this map, uh, the spotted lanternfly is surely extended by now. It seems that like it's constantly being updated by different states as uh, more populations are, are found and new quarantine zones are established. So you can see they have spread out quite a bit from the area where they first uh, were located in Brooks County, Pennsylvania, and sort of the southeast um, corner of the state and spread to a number of other states on the eastern seaboard. Um, this top map here actually just came out from Pennsylvania Department of Ag uh, within the last couple of weeks, and they have expanded their quarantine to include 26 counties. Certainly, um, within the next couple of years, if not this year, the entire state of New Jersey will eventually be considered a quarantine area for spotted land fly. So what the quarantine means is if you're traveling in and out of the area, the quarantine area that is of New Jersey um, or Pennsylvania, and there's a number of different things that you're going to want to and be required to inspect um, before you're able to move things in and out of the quarantine zone. This could include um, landscape and construction waste, firewood, anything that's been outside for a temporary or permanent amount of time where a spot of land implies could be hiding and, and unknowingly transported. There is a homeowner's um, quarantine area compliance checklist that you can access on the New Jersey Department of Ag website. Additionally, businesses, municipalities, government agencies must obtain a, a permit if they have a number of vehicles that are constantly transporting in and out of the quarantine zone. As a member of the New Jersey Water Supply Authority, I actually went through the process to get that permit, and we now have specific um, spotted lantern fly um, permits for all of our vehicles in the Water Supply Authority, as well as a spotted lantern fly collection kit. If anybody in the authority, any employees happen to run across these critters in their, uh, in their travel, um, they're able to basically record all of the information on where they found them, how many, um, th that kind of information, which is then reported to the New Jersey Department of Ag Spotted Lanternfly Hotline. Where do I look for spotted lanternfly? Unfortunately, the answer is literally anywhere. They can lay their egg masses on nearly any substrate. So if anything that's been outside for even a temporary amount of time at least deserves a look. Um, the nymph of the spotted lanternfly can be very small and also do pose a risk for movement, you can see in the sort of top middle photo there, a number of uh, small spotted lantern fly nymphs. It looks like inside of a butt uh, could certainly go unnoticed. Um, the egg masses on a wooden deck could be very easily missed. Even on the bottom right, you can see on a, a plastic child's uh, playset, they're underneath a, a plastic ladder. So they could really be just about anywhere. As far as decontamination, uh, you want to make sure you're inspecting all of your vehicles and your equipment. If you're going to be traveling in and out of the quarantine zone, um, make sure that uh, you're looking for every stage of the spotted land fly. And you always want to know when you are in an infested area, when you're in the quarantine area, just go the extra mile to make sure that uh, you're not going to be a, a vector to spread them to a different area. And you've uh, you know, you've inspected yourself and your vehicle before heading out. Um, you want to avoid storing any items under tree lines if possible where spotted lanternfly may drop onto or into your equipment undetected. Consider possibly 
covering or screening your equipment with a, a tarp or other covering if practical. And, uh, you know, from mid-September through spring, you got to realize that egg masses are the number one way they can spread, so that's what you want to be looking for. And just remember that any material out that's being stored outside can be used as a, as a surface uh, for egg masses to be laid on. And uh, that's what I have. Thank you very much for listening. I'd be happy to take uh, any questions that you do have. Um, all right. Thank you, Nick. Um, and thanks for everyone who was able to stay around for the whole time. We realized this went um, a little longer than usual and longer than we um, intended, but a lot of great information for both people. So um, didn't want to cut anything off. We will be sending out um, a, we will be sending out materials that were mentioned from every, um, to the presenters. Um, I'm just going to do like two quick questions um, or one quick question for Nick. There was um, in the discussion a number of questions about burning uh, firewood or using wood that had been infested with either of the two um, species you talked about. Yep. You can absolutely burn firewood locally um, that has really uh, risk of being infected by either one of these pests. Um, the number one thing is just uh, don't transport it. <laughs> if you're in an area where, especially if you're burning ash wood, for example, at this point, I would just go ahead and, and assume that if you have ash trees on your property and you're in central Jersey, that it's likely infected. Um, so I, I wouldn't be transporting any ash wood, even if you just cut down a completely healthy ash tree last year and dried the wood out. Um, I wouldn't risk it. So same thing with spotted lanternfly. You know, you can you can check it for uh, any firewood that you had out there for potential uh, egg masses. Just my my word of advice is uh, do not transport it. Um, and then one other question: You're talking about treating the trees for ten years um, with emerald ash borer. After ten years, what happens? Can you stop? And it's going to be fine. <laughs> or uh, like I said, uh, I'm going to put the disclaimer out there that it is not a guarantee that the tree is going to forever be uh, immune to emerald ash borer, but that is the recommended time from a, a number of studies that has been used that uh, consistency in the treatment every two years for 10 years will allow a high enough level of the MMX and benzo um, to establish in the tree that it should be good to go, but you're going to want to make sure that you still keep up to date with checking um, on the tree, uh, protecting your investment, making sure that uh, all of a sudden you're not seeing signs of, of dieback or other signs of emerald ash borer infestation. And if you do, um, there have been cases where additional treatment options have been pursued. Um, all right. Well, thank you again. I want to thank um, both Mike and Nick. And um, I think that'll be it for today. If you have any more specific questions, um, both Nick and Mike's emails will be in our follow up and we feel free to reach out to them. We'll have information on both of them and that information and um, the link to the recording of this will be on our website as well. Um, so thanks again. Happy Earth Day. And uh, we hope to see you next in two weeks. We have another one. Um, like I mentioned at the beginning, uh, in two weeks, we're going to have organic yard care and lawn alternatives. There were a couple of questions today in the chat box about turning your lawn into pollinator or meadow. Um, there, I think I saw one about putting it near a septic system or over a septic system, planting on that. So those would both probably be great things to talk to our presenters about in uh, two weeks on the 6th. Um, so thank you very much.